Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, we're going to give folks a few more minutes to get into the um, Zoom webinar, and then we'll begin. While we're um, waiting for folks to get out of the waiting room and join us, if you all wouldn't mind putting, um, uh, introducing yourself through the chat, that would be great, just so everyone has a sense of who's with us today. So just a brief name and um, uh, who you're with or what community you live or work in, that would be great. Thank you for being with us. What an awesome group we have with us today. Thank you all. That's uh, and thanks for being so quick with your uh, chat introductions. Um, I think the the numbers are slowing down a little bit on um, coming into the webinar. So um, in the interest of time, and we know you all are busy, and that it's Friday, and we're standing between you and the weekend possibly. So um, I'm going to go ahead and kick things off, and then we'll just I'm sure people will continue to join um, as we. Uh, move forward. So good afternoon. I'm Sarah Manji. I'm a public policy officer at the Colorado Health Foundation. And um, I'm facilitating some of today's meeting, which is um, a great honor. And thank you for joining us. Um, this is the second webinar in today's Reimagining Housing Solutions series. Um, and we're so grateful that you set aside time for this today. We really, truly hope it's a, an engaging and, and helpful two hours for you. Um, this morning, I was trying to come up with a witty April Fool's joke that would be somehow appropriate for this meeting, and I totally came up short. Uh, today's topic and agenda is just too good to joke about. Um, so instead, I just want to wish you all a happy April and spring, and um, hopefully we don't have too many snowstorms standing between us and um, good weather. Um, so again, as you all continue to join the webinar, we invite you to introduce yourself in the chat uh, so that folks can get a sense of who's attending today. Um, it's a really great, diverse group. and um, we know that we have attendees from all around the state. Um, I want to take a quick moment to um, thank the series sponsors because this has truly been a group effort and lift and it's been wonderful to work with this group um, and they've been engaged and helpful and they've been willing to give their time and distribution lists and help shape the content of the series. So as you can see on the screen, um, this group includes Project Moxie, CHAFA, the Munic Colorado Municipal League, Colorado Counties, Inc., Housing Colorado, Enterprise, um, the COVID eviction, eviction Defense Project, and Colorado Center on Law and Policy. And thank you, sponsors. We really do truly appreciate all you've done to, to make this success already. Um, so as you all are aware, today is the second of a six-part series. Um, and on the screen, you can see the dates and themes for the full reimagining Housing Solutions series. Um, this is truly designed to have each session build one on top of the next. So we hope that you can join us for each one throughout August. Um, and today's session is focused on developing strong community housing strategies. Um, so before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, this is a Zoom webinar, so your cameras have been turned off and your audio is automatically muted. Please use the chat function that you'll see down at the bottom with all the the other tools on your Zoom screen um, to submit questions, or um, you can let us know in the chat if you're having any technical difficulties. But for questions, um, we'd really like you to use that Q&A function. Um, we will be saving a little bit of time at the end of all of today's presentations for a Q&A period. 
So as questions arise for you, please put them in that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then we'll be collecting them and asking as many of them as we can to our panel presenters together at the end. Um, we recognize we might not get to all questions, so we'll do our best to, to group together into some themes. But for today's presentations, if there's a specific speaker you'd like your question asked to, or if it's related to Jen Lopez's presentation or the panel discussion, if you could name that or name the panel member specifically um, when entering your question in the Q&A function, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. And then one more housekeeping item. Today's webinar um, and each one in the series will be recorded and then they're posted to a website next week. We will put that website in the chat just in case you wanna visit the site and didn't um, after last one, but each registrant will receive a follow-up email in the next week with a link to that website. It will have the recordings from the Zoom along with the presentation from today. And that's really important because in this presentation you'll see hyperlinks and once that presentation is posted on the website, you'll be able to click on those hyperlink links and have access to all those resources. Um, and then a record area, a Zoom invite for the next session in May should be sent out um, in the next couple weeks um, ahead of the series. So uh, look for an email from Zoom for, for the May series. Um, so real fast, before we launch into presentations, I just wanted to give a quick overview of the Colorado Health Foundation as we're sponsoring this series. And I know some of you might be very familiar with the foundation, but we're also likely new to many of you, which um, I personally find very exciting. Um, so just a real quick introduction, the Health Foundation works to bring health within reach for all Coloradans. Um, and we do this by engaging closely with communities across the state. And we use various tools, um, investing, policy advocacy, learning and capacity building to help achieve this mission. Um, in all of our work, we seek to improve health equity um, in the lives of those around the state who have um, had low, who live on low income or have had historically less power or privilege. Um, we're a bit unique at the foundation. We have a dedicated policy team that I'm um, lucky to be a member of, and we work very closely with our grant making team to further our strategic priorities, and one of which is affordable housing. So specifically reducing the number of households living below 80%. Um, area median income or and spending over 30% of their household income on housing. And we also wanna increase the ability and create options um, for healthy living in the selected communities. We want folks to be able to live where they work, where they want to live, where their family is. Um, so it's just an honor to get to work in this space and engage with all of you. So um, enough about the foundation, let's get started. Um, but before we dive into today's presentations, we want to learn a little bit more from all of you since we have you captured um, in the Zoom space today and get your wheels turning about today's topic. So we're going to take a few minutes, as you see on the screen, to get a sense of how your community approaches engagement and what the primary barriers, barriers are to doing so. So if you don't mind um, selecting um, this first one, what is your number one barrier or challenge when it comes to community engagement? And we're asking you to pick only one. I know that's probably a bit of a challenge, um, but, but just to try to get your, your top barrier. Um, and we'll give a, about 30 seconds and then see what you all have to say. Oh, here we are. Should have popped up for all of you, hopefully, as well. Um, it looks like at 48% need to know how to do it effectively. I certainly hope today, hopefully, um, can help you all with some, some uh, you know, ideas for that. And then time at 26%, um, very understandable. Money and then language and translation needs. Thank you, that's, that's really interesting. I think we have one more poll that should be launching about how much of your local American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, funds are going towards housing. Again, single choice.
Um, at 55% in the lead is unsure and I don't know. Um, next is 10% at 14 and then uh, 50% followed by 25. So thank you. And I think that's actually really interesting and good to know that you all might not know. It's uh, obviously they're very new funds and it's confusing and the flow from federal to state to local is um, always a challenge. So thank you for your, for your honesty and, and that. Um, so enough from me, I am, um, and thank you for indulging us in those polls. I'm um, gonna really kick it over to the experts now. So our today's series is gonna start with a presentation from Jen Lopez of Project Moxie. And Jen, thank you so much for your time and expertise today. So fun to do these. Um, this is what I live for, Sarah, as you know, being a housing geek. I noticed somebody put in the chat that zero wasn't an option on ARPA funds and I get, this is my bias. <laughs> that zero is not an option, but you're right, we should have put it on there because uh, a lot of communities maybe either don't know they can do it or don't want to. Um, so what we're going to do today, or let me back up, there's a few of you who maybe uh, don't know who I am. So I'm an affordable housing consultant. I'm based out of uh, Southern Colorado. I've been doing affordable housing for 22 years. I have a small consulting firm called Project Moxie, and I've been uh, blessed to be able to work at multiple levels of government and in community. And I've also had some background in grassroots organizing. So I bring those lenses to the table, and you'll see that in my presentations. I do want to introduce my staff who are with me. So Matt Lynn, who's running the show. Hey, Matt. And then we have Kathleen Van Voris, who's helping um, monitor questions. Thanks, Kathleen. Next slide. So what I'm going to do in the next 45 minutes is set the stage around how does a community um, start with community housing strategy? Where do you start? What are the things that you would look at? I want to leave you all with a framework for thinking about housing strategy. Uh, I want to provide some definitions, um, but this is truly a 101 session. So uh, some of you, again, some folks, this may be the first time we're really talking about housing strategy together. Others may, maybe should be co hosting with me, uh, but we will set the stage um, with that framework and um, that will lead in really nicely to the panelists in that conversation. Uh, the things that you wanna know just out of the gate around housing strategies, you've gotta start with data. And what I'll say about that is there's lots of um, organizations that uh, or consulting groups that will get you data and data is really important, but it's just the first step. And I think where communities get tripped up is they think that that's gonna, you know, that's the end all be all. And it actually can sometimes create more chaos. And so we're gonna talk about how you get from data to strategy. Um, I try to keep strategy very simple because housing is, is development, it's real estate, it's markets, it's very complicated. And so uh, that is my goal is to, to kind of bring it down and make it easier to talk about and think about. It, it's all about knowing the resources. That's why we had that question in the poll. Uh, right now, local governments have housing money. Um, some of them have gone through very extensive public process on how they're gonna use ARPA, some have not. And it, always ask, if you don't know, reach out and see what, what if it's not too late to advocate for housing. It is definitely a use of ARPA funds. Uh, creative capacity building. Uh, I know I personally don't have enough capacity for this moment. I don't think anybody on my team does. Most of the communities I work with, I mean, I don't know anybody who has the capacity right now. So we need to figure out how to create capacity as quickly as possible so we don't lose uh, momentum, right? Uh, incredible opportunity, um, once in a lifetime in my career, uh, but also incredible obstacles, challenges, and need. And, and so how do we come together and, and really be collaborative on solutions? Local policy is very critical. And in, in many ways, local policy can happen more quickly sometimes than development can. And so we'll talk about some trends we're seeing there. We talk about public-private partnerships, but in housing development, it really is always public-private partnerships. And so we'll talk about what that means and how, how do you uh, get the best alignment with the private sector. There's some pretty great developers and lenders out there. How do you find them and how do they, how do you get them to help you uh, solve housing in your community? Next slide. But it all starts with community. So I was a grassroots organizer in my 20s and came into affordable housing and community work with that lens. And so this feels somewhat comfortable to me, but what I found out very quickly, moving into more of a traditional affordable housing policy environment or even uh, real estate development, this is not as common. And so I wanna tease this out and we wanna give you a, a number of ways of framing community engagement and some tools. So 
community engagement in, in our world is the process of working collaboratively collaboratively with and through groups of people affiliated by geography or special interest have a similar situation and they're and they're trying to figure out a housing solution that's very different than uh, I am applying for federal funds and I'm I'm going to develop a project in my community and I am required to hold a meeting right very very different things here and um, and and even that I am required to hold a public meeting can be much more rich than that. But that's sort of the some of the, the, the left and right side and not politically, but just sort of the spectrum uh, that we think about with community engagement. And we want to break this down because it's not as, as clear and there's some nuance to, to how to approach this. Next slide. Um, but, you know, community engagement, much of the work, I mean, we've got decades of best practices really came out of public health, right, uh, for many, many years and early community organizing. And, and when we started uh, teaching community engagement a few years ago, we found there's actually a lot of resources out there. So again, we'll, we'll point those out for you all. I wanna show you a chart that I actually got when I started consulting with Colorado Health. I love using this chart. I think it's very helpful. So on the left is um, what it looks like if you're engaging community and in, in your state or government and what your outcomes are and what you're trying to do all the way to the right, which is when community leads and um, we're all um, responding to their, their process. And everything in between, um, this is, a, I think, a great matrix because where you land on the matrix has everything to do with what is the role that you're playing at that moment. It has everything to do with what's the purpose of what you're doing and the methods you were using and, and what you're trying to do. So, uh, you know, I, I hope this is an interesting matrix for, for others who've maybe not seen this before. And if, um, if you're in a place where you're trying to solve a community housing solution, and this is day one, we really encourage and, and challenge you to try to be as far right as you possibly can. Um, what we find is when you think about it, uh, local electeds are very powerful, it's very important, but elections change. And the true change in community, I mean, housing takes years, sometimes decades, is only gonna really be sustainable if it's community driven. Next slide. This was a, another tool we came up with on our team when we started working on this stuff. Uh, community engagement is not just about process, it's about how we show up. It's about our attitude and our behavior. It's about listening first, building relationship. I have learned so much about language justice from my friends in Fort Morgan, which you're gonna hear from Lauren later today. I'm also learning about language justice from some work in Durango that we'll talk about as well. How we share information is really, critical, right? I mean, so we can talk about being open and showing up in dialogue, but if we're not giving all the information, if we're not being transparent with partners, um, we're not gonna get there. And transparency comes up a lot in community engagement, both with um, the folks that we are hoping to work with or serve as well as neighbors, right? And it, it, it should be all of those things. And it's a dialogue. Uh, you know, we, we create much better solutions if we're having Con constant conversations. And you'll see that when we talk about how we actually develop strategy. Next slide. So where do you start? So we're gonna start a project. We wanna do some, um, we wanna create some housing strategies in our community. Um, think about, you know, um, assess your preferred methods, not yours in particular, but the communities, right? So when I start a project in community, that's one of the first things I'll say is how do you wanna communicate? How would you like to do this work together? And I let them tell me, of course, that was different in COVID. Most of this had to be online. But now as we're moving forward, we're finding that some communities still want to be online. Um, so, so we still ask that. Uh, what's the preferred method? Um, always plan on using multiple channels. Um, provide multiple opportunities. Again, some people are, need paper. They're going to read something. Um, others uh, want to be in community together, breaking bread to share information. Uh, Matt has done some really cool landing pages for some of our projects. That's my method of communication. I like to go click and be able to read stuff. So next slide. Make sure your methods are accessible. We're, we're learning more and more and more, and I'm very humbled by this. I'm, I'm, I'm learning every day um, how to think about this, but we've got um, physical accessibility we want to address, language, culture, location, time, right? We have barriers. Uh, depending on who we'd like to talk with or work with or meet. Um, they may have childcare issues, all kinds of things. So 
uh, I, whenever I start work in community, I ask who, who, for who? The for who will drive all of this and how you think about this, this engagement process. Um, it's important to ask questions that are open-ended, not leading and unbiased. Nothing has taught me this better than the work we do with the unhoused. And actually, um, Dr. Kathleen's taught me a lot of this and is mentoring me in this, but that's um, not assuming what people on the streets um, need or want, but asking, asking what they need and want in that moment and, and, and not just asking, but trying to, to answer. Um, get active consent, this is really important. Uh, we need to have verbal consent for most methods of engagement. There's also written consent, especially if you're like um, recording meetings or interviews, et cetera. It's really important to have those consents in place as well as a technical. Next slide. When do you begin the, the community engagement process? Uh, this depends on who you are engaging. So I'll just, I mean, I wear multiple hats, right? So I might be in community. If I'm in community, I'm starting community engagement there, right? Other times I'm not um, being brought in at the beginning. I'm being brought in at the middle or the end of the process. So sometimes I'll be, um, or you will be brought in to support a project that's midstream. It's So it's really clear to be thoughtful about what that means to be coming into a project that's already got resources, it's been fairly defined, right? The engagement looks different. Um, be clear what you're required to do versus what you would like to do. Uh, the public process can create significant challenges. And I saw we have a lot of electeds and, and uh, local governments on today, and we so appreciate you. You've got a really hard job always and really hard now. And you know this better than anyone, right? That um, public process can kill projects. So we, we think about, um, you know, what, what you know, what are your adversaries going to say? You know, who's prone against? You have to be very strategic about this. Messaging is key. So I, one of the first things we'll do in community is we'll say, how are you talking about housing? Tell us what to say and not say. Uh, we have communities that say, we hate the term workforce housing. It implies that some people don't work. We have communities that say, if you don't use the term workforce housing, nobody will come to your meeting. So again, this is community driven process. Um, remember that, um, 99.9% .9 of the time you're using public subsidy for housing. When you're not using public subsidy, I wanna to talk to you because you're unique and you're doing something interesting. Uh, and that's not facetious in any, um, me, in any way. We just know the federal government is um, funding housing probably eight to one. Um, and we'll talk more about resources in a minute. Um, but you are likely going to submit paperwork and, and it's gonna become part of the public record. So we have seen partner agencies or partner developers go out and say, we're gonna do X, Y, and Z. And then they submit, submit documentation, it doesn't match. It's not being transparent. So um, if this is probably the best thing our teams learned in the last couple of years, if you believe you're gonna have a contentious project, get a third party facilitator. I know my projects are my babies and I cannot be unbiased. And if there's gonna be something uh, contentious, I, I'm not serving anyone if I'm leading a conversation about it. So next slide. Uh, moving towards community empowerment. This is really hard to do, um, uh, but it's critical, again, because if you want to look at sustainability of projects and creating community, right? So housing is about um, safe places. It's about health. It's about um, thriving, but it's also about community. And so we know the more that we can engage community, uh, just the better these projects are going to be long term. Many, many of our projects that we set up um, four to five years later could have challenges because we didn't have that community building process in place and um, right they're living and, and breathing projects. Um, this is especially true uh, for folks who have experienced trauma or have been disenfranchised um, in their life or even in the housing system, which we know is not uncommon. Um, as you move to that right of that continuum I had a few slides ago, you will be investing more time and resource. And this is the biggest point. If you really believe in community empowerment and community led process, you're going to be spending years. This isn't a couple months. It's not a project. It's years. Um, and I want to be really clear. Not every project can be led by community. Not right. We have to have a mix. People have to be housed now. So it's just about being aware where you're landing on that continuum and being very um, uh wanting to be where, where you want to be at that moment in time. Next slide. So there's quite a few tools right now. So we wanted to share some of them that have worked really well for our team. So we, we stumbled across this tool called Conveo. And um, one of the hardest projects we worked on was citing 
um, manage camps in Denver, um, you know, in downtown neighborhoods um, during COVID, it was a very challenging process and and we needed to do engagement. We needed to do it in a very structured way. So Conveo gave us an opportunity to put all the information that we had about the project in one place and people could engage in that information and give us feedback. So uh, we also you know, held some um, info sessions and other things, but we found that was a really great tool. Obviously we're using Zoom now. I can't imagine gathering you all together how expensive that would be. It'd be really fun, but it, it wouldn't be very cost effective. So here we are, right? Um, then there's a lot of free online tools right now. Um, and, and it's been a year since we taught this, taught this and there's more since then, but we have a page, the next page map. Here's some links. So uh, again, the PowerPoint will be sent out. There'll be um, links on Colorado Health's landing page, but here's some of our favorite tools that you'll be able to access. Next slide. All right, so we're, we're thinking about engagement and now we need to figure out what's happening in our community. So. Again, data is really important. And one of the big challenges that we see, and I suspect many of you are experiencing is um, data has been difficult during COVID. We don't really know what's going on. So many of the needs assessments I've, or strategies I've worked with have been uh, looking at needs assessments that were done in 2019. So, which is really challenging. <laughs> um, but our option is to wait for better data, which I don't think is an option because there's too many people in need. So. Um, so it's progress, not perfection when it comes to data. Um, that's our recommendation. And um, most times when you're looking at housing needs assessment data, it's, there's plenty to work on. So it'll, it'll give you the trends. Um, and some of my community partners, you know, you get these needs assessments and they're 130 pages, right? Uh, they can be pretty hard to dissect. Uh, but what you will see in a needs assessment is census data, you'll see market data, employment trends, current and future need. And for me, like I get overwhelmed very easily. I just go to that as executive summary, <laughs> right? That executive summary of a needs assessment is going to give you what you need to know. Um, what's really important as well, um, I, I say this anytime I work in community, is the purpose of a needs assessment is not that you need to meet that need. It's to plan. Uh, to paint a landscape of what's happening in your community, it will it will be overwhelming. Don't let don't let it overwhelm you. Think about how can the community increase our resources, our housing, our services by thirty percent in the next few years. So the needs assessment is here. You're here. It's it's moving you towards meeting more of the need. But there's no way any of the communities I work in could meet all their needs. So it's one of the frustrating things about needs assessments as documents. The other thing that I get a lot of feedback on, and our team doesn't do needs assessments. These are really economist type groups and they're, and again, they do great number crunching and it's really important. They typically don't do strategy. So they may come to you and say you, so I know in my community, we have, I don't know, 6,000 renter households paying too much for housing. It, it doesn't, um, the, the assessment might say, so you need more rental housing, but it doesn't tell you how to do that. And, and that's because that's not part of the scope of the work. So. I really want everybody to think about needs assessments as separate than a strategic plan. Next slide. And then I want to di differentiate needs from market. And this is a huge mistake I see often. In fact, I had some calls uh, last week where this was coming out. So uh, he here's what I mean by that. So, so you might have a community that needs 2000 rental units and we know that they need rental units between 600 and 1200 a month in rent. So a community group gets together and they look at converting a motel and they're gonna um, ha create 60 units and they aren't worried at all about filling those units. That's a mistake. We find this over and over again. You may have great need that doesn't translate into desire or marketability for a specific product type. And so um, what we would coach the community on is that's great, you have this need study. You need to do a market study now for that particular type of unit in that location. Um, and, and I've been doing market studies for years and I love doing these. And I love doing these at the beginning of a concept because they can truly uh, direct where you go with your concept. So somebody might come and say, hey, we've got 10 acres of land and we think we're gonna do 50 units. We may say, can we do a market study with you? Um, they're not super expensive. We wanna test out some theories around your product type, make sure it's there. And always we get information back that makes the project stronger. The other thing to keep in mind is, again, 
federal, state, or local, there's likely government funding, all of them are gonna require that you proved your market. And so it's a really important component. I do wanna call out for the first time ever since I've been working in Colorado, there are actually state resources for needs assessments again. And we'll, we'll show you some um, slides and connections at the end of the presentation for how to find out about those resources. But a lot of things are happening at the Department, Department of Local Affairs. And I know we have multiple staff on with us today and we're grateful for the work you all do. Thank you. Next slide. This is a little snapshot of, I'm gonna use a lot of examples from La Plata County and Durango because I, I live here, I work here and I can answer detailed questions if people have them. Um, so so I, I thought they would it would be easier for me to kind of highlight specifics using that. So here we had a needs assessment done last year and uh, the consultants came back and said, I mean, this is like 800 units of housing that they think we need in our community in the next three years. We're used to producing um, below market housing, maybe 100 units. So this is a huge increase. Um, it's very aggressive. Uh, but what I find really helpful as I develop strategy is those buckets, right? The way that I think about doing surge beds is motel conversion, something like that. The way I think about low income rentals is the tax credit program. The way that I think about workforce rentals is partnership with private developers. The way I think about ownership is multiple strategies, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But you, these scorecards are really important. They're really easy to articulate need. They're really easy to track um, outcomes too. Next slide. So all housing strategy boils down to one or one of these two steps. You're either subsidizing development or you're subsidizing a household. When you subsidize development, you're reducing the cost of the development, right? And you want it to be below market and you're subsidizing the development so people can afford it. Put another way, you're providing some kind of resource for the developer to, to be able to afford to offer below market rent or mortgage without going bankrupt or losing profit. And um, we know developers have a return on investment and they should, or they wouldn't be in business. And if they can't make that return on investment, they won't do it. So we, this is where we incentivize or make that possible. Household subsidies where we are subsidizing the people, right? So um, we're reducing a person's housing costs through either providing rent assistance. Um, Section eight vouchers is a very popular program at the federal government level. And it pays the difference between what somebody earns and what a market rate rent is. And it does it month, month after month for multiple years. So it's kind of a permanent subsidy. There are other programs out there, but I highlight Section 8 because it's a very popular one. Um, we also may subsidize somebody with mortgage assistance. So a house is going in my community for 300 and the family can only afford 250. We give them 50,000 and a second mortgage and they're on their way. Um, so, right, so money goes to how, units or it goes to people. Next slide. And then we say, well, we want to do this. We want to give money to units and we want to give money to people in our community, but which, which things, which things do we do? So this was a, a diagram a colleague shared with me and I absolutely loved it. On the left, you have vision, resource, capacity. On the right, you have political will, creativity, and partnership. And in the middle is your strategy. And um, there's a technical term in our field called sausage making. <laughs> That's what we do when we do strategy work. It's... Um, I wanna give a very clear example of this. Um, we did some informal strategy work during COVID where um, my community wanted to convert a motel and we wanted to do it to address the rising need of, home, uh, of the unhoused in our community. So we had vision to address the issue. We had some resources identified, but not all of them that we needed. And we had some capacity, but not all capacity. We had significant political will, some creativity and, and, and we were working on partnership. We did not end up converting the motel for the unhoused because we could not get the full capacity we needed and the full resource to, to do it right. So we, but we did decide to convert the motel and so we're creating affordable housing. So our strategy um, that we decided on was to create 120 units of affordable housing. But getting to that point where that was the strategy was months of conversation, analysis, understanding what it would take to do it. And, in housing, it's not just about how do we build it right, it's how do we operate. And in many cases, operations can be more tricky. So we wanna be thinking about when we build something, it's gonna be with us for 20 years and it's gonna be run well. Next slide. I wanna bring this up. We had multiple um, 
comments in the chat last time and I really appreciated it and I wanted to make sure we addressed it in this uh, session and we're going to go into greater detail um, at the end of the series when we talk about development but it was a question about where does the environment fall when we think about below market housing and housing housing markets these are general statements um, but basically below market housing and environmental considerations have a long history of being compatible with one another for decades, the housing industry has wanted below market housing to be in locations that minimize the need for cars and use existing infrastructure. Um, infill development is what we always want to do. Um, increased density or other critical activities that minimize our environmental footprint as an industry. Redevelopment of existing structures and preservation are also more environmentally friendly than new construction. Building homes right now, if you do use federal and state money, which again, I think 90%, 95% of us do, you will be building to some kind of um, environmental standard like National Green Building Council, Energy Star, et cetera. Um, and then we will discuss green building more in, set in uh, on August 5th. So our the below market industry, we're doing this. Our challenge right is the greater market, which is a whole nother conversation, but I just wanted to address this. Thank you. Next slide. So when we do housing strategy, we have lots of strategies. And so the other thing we wanna leave you with is that um, um, it's great to be innovative, but check and see what's already happening because we know many, if not all of these strategies can work um, in different situations. So I'll just pick one to talk about. So pr providing county or town land. So about five years ago, the city of Durango donated land on our social service campus for a housing project and it just opened its doors last fall. This is a very common strategy, right? Um, many of these other ones are a little more complicated like doing inclusionary zoning or things like that. But uh, having these kinds of frameworks when you go to start community strategy work is very helpful. And I'll show you a couple other tools that we're using right now. Next slide. And then again, bucketing things. So it's easy to kind of articulate what's what. So um, I like, you know, we, we have learned a lot in the last couple of years about preserving existing housing. Not a new topic, it's been around for a decade, but it's become urgent now, right? Absolutely urgent. Um, top of the list is mobile home parks, right? We've got 71 in my community that um, at, at any one time could be um, lost. Um, and then we've got, you know, existing affordable housing stock that is expiring. And then we have what's called naturally occurring affordable housing, which is housing in the community that's already affordable. Is there a way that we can kind of snatch that up? And again, we've learned a lot with increases you saw in the last series. Um, pricing was up 20% in one year because of COVID in, in multiple places and nationally. And so um, this is really critical now. Of course, we also need to promote and develop new rental and for sale housing. And this is like the worst time ever to try to do that. I'll just be really blunt. So any of you who are working on housing projects, I am with you. This is really challenging. It's never been more expensive, um, multiple challenges and supply chain, but we still have to keep trying to do this because we just need the product. And then the piece again, that I feel like our industry has finally gotten our arms around and understands the value of is stabilizing people who are housed. And so, um, um, this is really a lot of nonprofits or faith groups and some local governments do this work directly, but it's let's uh, make sure people have what they need to stay housed. Let's take care of emergency assistance. Let's do utility assistance. Let's do rent assistance. Um, let's do mortgage assistance. And then we also have learned a lot about you may have housing opportunities in your community, but they may not be accessible to everyone. And so how do you have home buyer education, renter education, tenant rights groups or services? homeless prevention, and how do you make sure that those services are accessible to everyone that you wanna serve and, and should be the whole community. Next slide. A couple examples of preservation efforts. So a um, year, year and a half ago, we were able to support, not we, but we, Durango, the community of Durango and Laquata County, supported the uh, transition of a mobile home park into a co-op. It was resident led, um, really challenging, very expensive, and, and they pulled it off and we were able to just support that work. but. Um, this was a prime piece of real estate um, on the river. We could not replace, we couldn't, there would be nowhere for those folks to go. So that was a really powerful project. And then a few years ago, we worked on um, preserving a, what we call a section eight building on our historic avenue. So right in the middle of the million dollar houses, we had this um, 
really nice brick building that was serving um, people with disabilities and seniors. And so we worked with the local community to refinance it and extend the, the affordability period for 20 years. But these were strategies that were, I would say, not very formal in the community. And we're seeing as we move forward, we'll, we will be um, recommending more formal um, strategies because they were successful and we need to do more of it. Next slide. Local preference, I'll just say this is new to me. Like I've, I've never had to think about we're going to build, you know, we've got a lot of pipeline in my community and in other communities I'm working and we're talking about hundreds of units. This is the first time we're saying that it isn't enough. <laughs> and we know that because we know just because you're building uh, units doesn't mean it's going to meet local demand. And so there's uh, lots of conversation and exploration around local preference. Aspen, Pitt, King County has been doing this forever. Um, but I think a lot of our other communities have not. So ways we think about that, you might do short-term rental policies to limit Airbnbs. You might have programs or initiatives with developers where units are set aside and you have to have a, a working or um, resident, resident uh, qualification to access the unit. And then we are seeing a huge uptick in employers entering the space. And we'll talk about how they're creating strategies. Next slide. Um, lots of ways that we're thinking about below market development. Um, at the end of the day, it takes money. That's So we have to decide, are we going to uh, bring money in from the state and subsidize? Are we going to have a local subsidy? And I see more and more communities saying, I don't want to be relying on the federal and state government alone. We, we need to have our own resources. So huge push to local resources right now. Um, one other thing that we also see around um, increasing below market opportunities is many communities don't have developers who are experienced doing tax credits or, you know, just certain product types. And um, it, it does require to, if you have an opportunity or you want to create one as a community that you would create a uh, Request for proposals, RFP, you'll see that a lot in our space, um, but you have to be offering something. So land, pre-development funds, a development opportunity, an option that you wanna assign. And this is how we create capacity uh, to, to have more development and different kinds of development in our communities. Next slide. Again, stabilize those who are already housed. And so we have some wonderful programs across the state, local programs, um, and it's a best practice if your community doesn't have a stabilization program. There are some that are regional. I highly recommend you reach out to Division of Housing and some of the state agencies and find out if there's a regional provider that could come into your community. Um, same thing with preventing homelessness. We're seeing more resources to address homelessness. We're seeing a lot more homelessness. Um, if communities are new to homeless strategy, we're going to have a whole session on it at June 5th around this topic. So we'll, we'll dig into that more later. Um, but the need is great. Next slide. Uh, homeownership, uh, we've been doing it. We were really good at it for a long time. And then obviously the market has made it extremely difficult to continue to do it. So um, Colorado Housing Finance Authority, I, I know we've got some folks on. They, they do a lot in the space. They have mortgages and um, down payment assistance and they help fund classes. Um, housing counseling, many of you all offer directly or are in communities that have it. It's a best practice that works. Mortgage assistance or down payment assistance um, was, an, you know, down payment assistance is I need the 3% to close on my house. Mortgage assistance is I need 20% because there's a huge gap between what I can qualify for and what my house um, price is. Mortgage assistance costs a lot more, but it's a really effective tool to move folks um, who won't have an option to buy in your community without that extra bump in support. Um, for, for some of my rural partners, Impact Development Fund does run a number of programs statewide. So if you don't know about them, we can connect you with them. They do a great job. Next slide. I wanna talk about equity in two different ways. Wanna plant a seed. We know, um, I could have thrown tons of stats on this slide, but I, we had some stats from the last presentation and I just wanted to focus on these points. Homeownership rates for, um, Communities of color, people of color, households is much lower. It's always been much lower and even, even more so now as we see the, the spike in pricing. Um, we have to create intentional opportunities to serve uh, our BIPOC um, community. And so it's going to take more than just offering classes or offering uh, mortgage assistance. And so uh, we're kind of watching some pilots in Denver and see how that goes. And then there's this thing called equity, right? That has to do with literally building wealth, right? And so um, resale controls, 
is a term we use in any housing program that we that we manage, we the collective industry, where we there's a discount um, between what um, the housing is worth and what the household is paying. And we want to recapture that because it, it shouldn't be a windfall for one household. It needs to be a subsidy that revolves for future households, or it should be attached to the unit for, for future use. Um, but, but when we create these resale controls, what we find is either they get, one thing is they can be really complicated and then nobody knows how to administer them. So we definitely don't want to do that. But even when we find kind of um, clear ways to do it, we have to balance the needs of the homeowner um, who wants to create equity. And we all know that um, home ownership is one of the biggest wealth generators in our country. So and we got to balance that with um, resales, right? So if, you know, if John got a $50,000 discount on the house and walks with that equity, we don't have it for the next person. So it's, it's a balance and we want everybody to be thoughtful about that. An example of how we've been addressing it in some places I work is if, um, the below market home that's being offered is 25% or more discounted for market. We want to have a price cap because that's a big discount. We want to be able to keep that in the inventory. If it's less than that, we may just do a second mortgage where we recapture some of it. Next slide. We're getting there. There's a lot to cover. <laughs> so um, capacity building, as I said, is really everybody's trying to solve for this right now. When we do strategy work, um, we always start with who's already in the community, right? We wanna know who's in the community doing what programs and can any of those programs be expanded? Once we kind of assess that, then we're looking at, okay, yes, no, and then here's the existing gap. So how do we fill the remaining gap? There's a huge increase in regionalism and I'm so excited to have you all here from Don later because I think Don's doing some great work um, in the San Luis Valley. Um, but, but regional agreements to share staff, share consultants, share programs. Uh, Colorado's a unique place. We have a statute around multi-jurisdictional housing authorities and people are often confused about what these are, but these are just um, local governments, um, regional entities that can tax, which is pretty exciting and run housing programs. They're not HUD housing authorities. That's a different thing. So that's an opportunity. I know a couple of communities right now um, considering creation of those. Um, always be thinking about a way to support private developers to create below market opportunities. That's how we get to scalable solutions. So that might look like, you know, a tap fee waiver program that um, if you provide units at X price point, you get these discounts when you go through the process with your local government, things like that. Um, some communities don't have enough local development ex expertise. And I mentioned this earlier, and we see more and more of that. And we also see places like Denver where the development um, community is tapped. And so um, again, we may be importing uh, development partners um, from out of area and there's ways to vet those partners to make sure, make sure they're a good fit for your project community, et cetera. And, and those are tools that can be shared. Um, I think this was not an issue five years ago. This is an issue everywhere I work. Um, if we want to bring in a developer to, to help us build something, there has to be an incentive. There has to be discounted land, pre-development resources. There has to be something because this is a developer's market right now. Um, and, and again, we can share how we do that, but uh, we're finding that to be effective as a tool to get developers. Next slide. Um, community strategy requires getting real clear on roles. So typically local governments are developing and implementing policies. Uh, they're responsible for where projects can go. They, they've got resources around um, that can go towards preservation. Um, so a lot of policy work there. Oftentimes they're also providing funding, land, um, and political support for competitive funding applications. So um, all really critical things. Our nonprofits are usually pr providing the programs and services. Some of them are developing. Our developers obviously are focusing on unit creation, but they vary greatly around expertise, market focus, and housing type. And then the, the state, federal agencies, and private investors really do define what they'll fund. So um, another thing we caution communities who are new to housing strategy is don't go off and create something really innovative if you're expecting uh, a certain group to fund it. Start with the funder, right? Define that, the parameters of the project with the funder at the beginning. Next slide. Ah, oh, this has been so much fun and overwhelming. And I think, I hope this never stops. Um, 
we're engaging local employers in multiple communities right now. Um, I'm going to talk again what we're doing in our backyard here in La Plata County. We did a survey with employers as part of a, a strategy project, and we had 55 respond, and eight of them said, we have land, give us a call. A really exciting. Um, we also have a local, it's called a local first fund, uh, which raises money from employers for broader community goals. Um, one of the things we we love about the employer partnerships is that um, not only is it new resource, but sometimes they can jumpstart something, right? So it takes government longer often to make decisions or move things forward. A gov uh, employer can go, hey, here's a site, let's go. <laughs> um, and I really think they're a, a unique power base and we have not used them effectively, at least in my career when I where I've worked. And, and we're gonna have to make policy changes at the local level and I'll be calling them for those things. Next slide. Um, a few more examples of employer initiatives we've seen. So again, donating or leasing land is becoming uh, much more common. We're seeing it with school districts, um, churches, employers, uh, and that's exciting and very helpful. Uh, we're seeing an uptick in like shared housing navigators. So um, for recruitment strategies, so there might be a dozen employers that come together and they are trying to find rental units they could employ a housing navigator to work with their group. Many employers are providing housing stipends to recruit right now, um, providing transportation. Uh, we've been using the tool of mortgage assistance for a long time, that's uh, very effective. Maybe master leasing units in an apartment complex and then um, sponsoring motel conversions. Uh, uh, Ski Resort did one last year and you know we're doing one here. It's definitely becoming a, a, a solid tool. Next slide. Public sector strategies, most common we see is um, repurposing underutilized assets, that parking lot, right? How many parking lots do we have that are government owned? Or um, uh, you, ha you had to buy uh, right-of-ways and you have some excess land, things like that. Local governments also, or any private uh, public sector entities can help identify redevelopment opportunities, whether it's their um, underutilized office spaces or help um, other opportunities in the community. We are working on trying to create pre-development funds. Um, we did some piloting with Best Western in Durango. We're also piloting with a mobile home conversion, um, but pre-development can be the, the difference between a project ever having a, a good look or, or never being an opportunity. Um, it's that early $100,000 that's really risky that it's very hard to come by. So uh, we are pretty excited about doing more of that. And then, um, Oftentimes public sector will fund and support our nonprofit partners to scale or just to continue services or help build capacity long-term. And then, as I said before, creating a long-term, uh, a local dedicated public funding stream is all the talk now, right, in many communities. Just a couple more slides. Um, this is just a reminder how we fund housing at the state level or what kind of housing we fund. I highlighted home ownership at 10% to make the point that um, in all the strategies I'm doing for sale, home ownership is the hardest to do because we have the least subsidy to do it. Um, and the costs are the costs. And um, we'll talk about um, some of the uh, potential um, strategies to address that. You'll see that we, we spend a lot of money on rental housing and that's because the federal government spends a lot of money on re rental housing. So we've got kind of an unbalanced um, federal housing policy. I just wanted to kind of share this. We had this in the first session, but I thought this was a powerful tool to see how this, this breaks down. Next slide. Um, again, American Rescue Plan Act, millions and millions of dollars, right? We talked about this last time, going to the state, going to local government. We wanted to give an example of how important it is to be tracking this stuff right now. So um, House Bill 22-1304 was introduced a few weeks ago um, where they're looking at straight um, state grants to invest in, in local affordable housing. And these funds would go to local governments and nonprofits. I've never seen a number this big before. So if you're, you know, in order to be competitive for funds like these, you need to have strategies on the ground ready to go. Next slide. Again, lots and lots of money, but if you don't know where to put it, it's very challenging as a community. Um, next slide. So how do you build housing strategy? Like, what do you do? So here's a process that we use and I know some other consultants that use it and it's really pretty straightforward with a lot of common sense. So we always start with um, 
interviewing folks around the community to find out what's going on. So, you know, what's the issue, challenge, opportunity, interest, resources, and activities, right? Spend a couple months getting the lay of the land. While we're doing those interviews, we're planting seeds. Um, oftentimes when we're in community, they may not know of different strategies that are available to them. So we start to kind of have those dialogues about, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And then we have to start to facilitate some community understanding. Again, start with how do you define affordable housing? Oh, you don't want to use that term? Okay, got it. Like we, we really have to do that now. There's so many communities using different terms and we have to start with those basic visions and premise around um, what we mean and what we want to do. Um, and then as you're having the conversations, you're identifying resources, you're identifying capacity, you're starting to pull those things together to see some um, very concrete actions. Um, and you're able to start say, identify so-and-so is doing this thing, has this resource and will implement in this time frame. And that's where you wanna land, right? Where you know where everybody's active and what's happening, turn that into a very simple scorecard and you can track your progress as a community towards those things. Next slide. Couple examples. I've been working in Taos, New Mexico for several months, and our, our strategies have taken a while to emerge, but this is one that um, is hopefully going to stick and we're going to launch soon. But there's a lot of interest from private community members and philanthropy to do some housing. Taos is very small, um, less than 10,000. Um, and, and their strategies are really being driven by private sector. Government's not real strong, there's not a lot of funding, even with ARPA. And we found a, a group that wants to do net zero affordable housing. They've modeled it, they can do it. Um, they said to us, well, we can't build this unless we have a pipeline of buyers, right? Which is true. And we don't have a lot of state resources and we don't have a, a agency that can really pull this project together. So the solution is to develop the, a housing nonprofit. And we came on that solution because there's multiple things that need to happen that would all be handled by this new nonprofit. But this nonprofit would come out of the gate delivering home buyer education, connecting buyers to rent assistance, and then helping identify development partners to develop those units. Um, we're hoping to, to um, start forming the nonprofit this summer. We think we need about 150,000 to launch, and then the resources available. There's some local government funds and home funds, but I think we're going to end up getting a lot of private sector support on this. Next slide. I think I saw some of my friends from Total Concepts. I should have told you I was going to do this one, but um, uh, Total Concepts is a great uh, community development group on the Eastern Plains. And so a couple of years ago, we started talking about the need for supportive housing in the Eastern Plains. The opportunity was they were fired up to do something. The challenge was we didn't have a site uh, identified at the time, uh, limited development capacity, and rural markets are really challenging to work in. And so um, the solution at that time was to hire a consultant to support the process, help access grants, get a better count of what's happening. And so um, I've had the pleasure, our team's worked with Steve and Shelly for a couple of years, um, assuming they've spent about 100,000 on pre-development. Many of the resources for pre-development have come from national groups. I'm happy to say we submitted a project for funding a few months ago. So a 30 unit project, we'll see if we get funded. Next slide. So, you're in community, you're talking about um, strategies. This is a tool that uh, Mary Coddington, who we work with developed for a very specific strategy we're doing right now. And I kind of love it and we've been piloting it and it's just very simple, um, but we, um, what you can't see, this is just a few of the fields. There's about 25 fields and we interview our city, our county, our nonprofit, our this group or that group. And it gives us very uh, tangible information about what they're planning, what they're doing, and what they would like to do if they had support. And so we fill out these forms and it turns into, um, we're able to rank you know, what's happening where, we're able to compare what one group's doing against another and start to create a, a picture of what's happening in the community. And then the next step in our process will be how do we coordinate and how do we leverage so that we don't have duplication and we get the best outcomes for the community. Next slide. All right, we're almost done, ooh, one o'clock. So keep in mind, again, for sale, housing's the hardest to do because of costs. Key strategies for that are free land or very discounted land, modular, using subsidies at every layer of the process. You have to have a pipeline of buyers. Don't just go build stuff. You gotta make sure people are ready to purchase. Um, rental projects are complicated. Bring in outside developers who know how to work those projects. Um, try to control that process of selection of a developer. Um, next slide. 
Um, housing development takes years, years, years. I think the biggest frustration I have as a consultant is someone hires me and they're like, what do you mean it's gonna take this amount of time? It takes a long time. Um, we didn't get into this mess overnight. So please be patient with us. We're doing the best we can. And so are you and we'll figure it out as best we can. It, more than ever, it's taking multiple strategies and it's gotten more complicated. Um, innovation and creativity are on the table because we've never been here before and we've gotta be able to do a better job of what we do. Um, you have to multitask as a community. You have to have big picture strategy while you work on a specific project. A lot of communities wanna do one or the other. I encourage you, you gotta do both. It's the best way to leverage resource and motive, um, momentum. And don't reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of good stuff already happening out there. You can just steal. Last slide. So there are some great resources. We have um, in, in Colorado, if you're looking for consultants that could help you with strategy, we have Chaffa's Small Scale Housing TA Program. Uh, I don't I don't think they do broad community strategy. I think they help with specific projects, but they're a great resource. DOLA has some new resources under 1271, which was a bill last year that funded some capacity building work in local government. The Division of Housing, uh, which is one of our primary funders, has it this page and they have these um, positions called development specialists and they can be a resource to you and then ask other communities. I think that's it, Matt. All right. Thank you, Jen. Um, if it's all right with our panelists here, I'm going to stop our screen share and we're going to move into our kind of Q&A panel discussion time. Um, if we could kick off with, um, well, first of all, thank you, Steph, Go, Warren, and Don for, for joining us today. Um, if we could go around and just have you kind of introduce um, who you are, who you work with, and, and the, kind of an overview of the work that you're currently doing in your respective community. Um, if we could start, uh, Lauren, I'll have you kind of kick us off if you don't mind. Well, I don't want to be the first April Fool here, but if I'm nominated, I guess. Um, hi, everybody, and thank you so much, um, Jen, and everybody else on this call for asking uh, me to be a part of the panel. Uh, why on earth you would do such a thing, but here I am, so I'm going to give you all the things I don't know. I have um, come to this work from two different angles. I work for the Hospital Association. Uh, my job used to be a uh, fundraiser. But because of housing issues, I'm now really a property manager. Um, so that's one hat that I wear. And then on the other end, um, I work for um, Fort Morgan Cultures United for Progress, which was born out of the Colorado Trust and Community Partnership as a housing organizer. So um, that's, and I'm out in Fort Morgan, Colorado. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Stefka, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I'm Stefka Fanchi. I'm the CEO at Elevation Community Land Trust. We are um, headquartered in Denver, but um, our, um, we have goals of reaching statewide um, and have begun to do that. So um, as a community land trust, we focus on affordable home ownership um, and more specifically on permanently affordable home ownership through the community land trust model, which um, in a brief explanation means that we sell the improvements to qualified buyers under 80% of the area median income. And we hold the underlying land in trust, um, tying the two together, utilizing a 99 year ground lease um, that uh, is a great example of the balance that Jen talked about between um, an individual's um, ability to gain wealth and a community's need for um, permanently affordable opportunity for its residents. Um, we are in, we started out in the, in the Denver area. We have um, uh, 100 units coming on in Fort Collins um, in the next year. Um, we're out in Delta and we are now soon to be down in Durango and we'll talk a little bit about that through the questions. Awesome, thank you, Stefka. Dawn, you are up. Um, hello everyone, I'm Dawn Melgaris with the San Luis Valley Housing Coalition. Uh, we are a affordable housing nonprofit in Alamosa that serves the six county region of the San Luis Valley. Um, currently on the persistent poverty list, four out of six 
counties on that list are in the San Luis Valley. So we are an extremely low income community um, and my organization works to help our community members find and maintain their affordable housing through um, properties that are rent assisted with USDA funding. So we have 59 units all together there. Um, we also offer the Division of Housing's down payment assistance and single family owner occupied rehab programs. And just this year started the USDA 533 housing preservation um, program as well. And we're doing some exciting things here in the Valley. We did a six county, 15 community housing study and are working on an action plan. And we also have several developments that are coming um, forth from that study, um, including um, one in Alamosa for our organization and one in Creed for our organization. And I believe there's eight or nine others throughout the six county region. Um, so we're very excited to, to see new and innovative affordable housing coming to a community with great need. Awesome. Thank you all again for joining us this afternoon. Um, as you've heard, we th this panel represents a wide breadth of expertise as well as work across the state in both rural and urban contexts and everything in between. Um, so we have a few questions that we wanted this panel to address specifically, but just a reminder that we're still collecting Q&A. Um, through Zoom. So if anything occurs to you as we kick off discussion here, please um, throw it in the Q&A. Uh, Jen will be part of this chat as well. So if, if any questions occur to you that were maybe refer back to earlier parts of the presentation, feel free to ask those as well. Um, I will kick us off discussing uh, what we what we kind of started our, our strategy presentation on, which was community engagement. Um, this can mean a lot of different things, look like a lot of different things. So to the panel, we would say, how do you define community engagement and how does it get facilitated in the work that you do? And anyone can, can answer and kick us off. I will call on you because I know you all. Um, let me help key this up a little bit because I do know not Don, you and I are new to each other, so I might not pick on you on the first call, but um, question. Lauren, this makes me think of um, Fort Morgan and the work that you've done. I think your engagement is incredibly unique. Would you mind talking about what you've all been doing over there? Sure, I'm here for that reason. So I'll give you what I got in. Um, so here in Fort Morgan, um, our primary employer is a uh, meatpacking facility. <laughs> and that brings with it all kinds of, uh, and, right? Number one is it brings a lot of folks from a lot of different places. And we end up being a secondary resettlement location for refugees. So um, it, with uh, an employer that has over 25% of your workforce, that obviously is going to represent a whole lot of your population, right? So um, our group, our first year, had a whopping budget of 16,000 bucks. So, I mean, right off the bat, you sit down together, you have dreams of building some houses and, you know, you just have to say, okay, we're not gonna build anything for 16 grand. What are we gonna do with, with this amount of money? So um, again, Jen said it several times. We, I wasn't prepared, but I mean, mentally I knew it was gonna take time, but here it is now six years later and we're still plugging away, but we haven't lost sight of uh, of the fact that we were focusing on advocacy and policy and not on per se building ourselves. We were not going to get anything built. So it was our group language. I mean, it was all about um, languages. We have over 26 languages here and um, getting folks together, even in a room that speak all the same language. I mean, we mis misunderstand each other all the time, right? And getting folks together now that are coming from various cultural backgrounds and speaking different languages and trying to agree. I'm gonna give you a perfect example of what I mean. We were just trying to come up with what we we're gonna call ourselves. We call ourselves now Fort Morgan Cultures United for Progress, but just to come up with a name, I can't tell you how many meetings and how many hours. Um, at one point we wanted to be Fort Morgan Cultures Unbound, I think is what, what it was. And um, that word, unbound, did not translate. 
there was no word that existed in Somali for, for unbound, right? So they kept coming up as broken. So how do you want to be known like this community is seeing Fort Worth culture's broken um, was not going to get us any uh, folks from that community. So sitting, coming back and coming back and finally, so those kinds of discussions just take a tremendous amount of time and the investment required for interpretation and translation. That was a hard pill to swallow. We knew we were not going to be, you know, we were going to have to spend our money on language. And language is not, people are like, you're supposed to be building houses. What are you spending money on language? It's part of the deal. I mean, it was tied. The boat, the things were so tied. So um, in order to engage our community, we had to translate everything. We picked four primary languages. If we had to do it again now, we would probably add a fifth because we have a lot of indigenous folks moving here. <clears throat> and that language is very difficult to get translators for at this time. Um, but we did in four, everything we do is in four languages, English, Spanish, Somali, and French. So you're, you're going cost times four. Every meeting's interpreted real time. You're wearing headsets. Um, every thing that you write down ends up having to get translated. Um, so you're sending it out to translators. It's a big investment. And Colorado Health Foundation has been um, very instrumental in grants for us enabling us to, to do a lot of this work. So thank you um, to them. And I'm gonna jump off and let somebody else kind of jump in there. So I'll, I'll add that for me personally, community engagement uh, wasn't something I thought of I would need to do when I got into this position because I thought I was providing housing. Um, and so engagement, wasn't a piece of that puzzle. Um, but I learned really quickly that my uh, complexes are their own community. And then the town they're in is their own community. And not only did I need to engage um, those we were serving to make sure we were serving them well, but I also needed to engage my community to make sure they understood what we were doing and why. And in housing, one of the biggest pieces is making community members that have never needed the services you're offering understand why we're here and what it is we're offering and who can qualify for them. Um, there's huge misperceptions in affordable housing and what that means. And 80% of your population in the Valley qualifies, but only 20% think they do. So a lot of my community engagement went along with educating the community on what is affordable housing, who qualifies, and why are we here. Um, and we did it in several ways, from starting within our own buildings and talking to those we serve, and then um, moving out and becoming participants in um, other organizations and what they were doing so that we could have a housing voice um, in different things, whether it was community development, um, economic development, um, things as simple as parks going in at your local Boys and Girls Club, you know, that gave us an opportunity to get out and talk to the people on a one-on-one -on -one basis before we started trying to do it in the larger scope. And I totally agree with the whole um, language piece. Not only is translation um, a big thing in our community, um, but remembering that housing has a lot of terms and words that if you're not in housing, you don't know what we're talking about. Um, we learned them all when we got into housing, and sometimes we forget that the general population doesn't understand that. So making sure when you're putting stuff out there that you're getting away from all the housing terms um, and you're talking or printing things in a way that um, the general population understands. So acronyms are huge for us, LITEX, AMIs. Um, you, you get so used to saying it every day and you're in these meetings and everybody's lost. So just kind of keeping that in mind as well, along with translation. And I'll echo um, Don's uh, note that 
there's so many levels of community engagement, right? There's so many different different points and different communities themselves, right? So as a newer organization, um, we are uh, our goal is to have one third uh, at a minimum at a minimum of our um, board of directors be represented um, as homeowners who are you know who own homes within our program. Um, and so, how do you do that as you're as you're reaching out to multiple communities and as you have, you know, you're starting out with a small number, right? Our first homeowner was at the very end of 2019 um, and we now have 145, um, but, you know, and we have 500 on the horizon in just the next couple of years. How, how do we adequately, um, you know, engage the community of our homeowners in a really meaningful way and not just in a token kind of way? Um, where we're, you know, giving you a spot on our board, but it's just because we have a slot to fill, right? We really want to be able to have, um, you know, the opportunity for the voices of the people that we're serving um, direct what we're doing. Um, and that's really, really important to us. Uh, back to, you know, the other organizational piece of community engagement, also as a new organization, um, you know, as we're trying to uh, do outreach and let people know that our homes are available, um, it's really important to build that trust and to let people know who we are. Um, and also, um, we're reaching really a hard to reach portion of the population. So there's folks that, um, again, as Don said, right, we're, we're serving under 80% of the area median income um, down to, you know, probably about 60% AMI. Um, and those are folks that are maybe not being served by a lot of the organizations that are doing outreach to low-income families. Um, and they are also people that have given up on home ownership. They do not think it is an option. They're not on Zillow. They're not looking around because they think it's no longer an option for them. So how do you do outreach um, and really connect with the folks that can benefit from this when they don't think that they can qualify, right? Um, and then layer onto that, really trying to focus on uh, BIPOC populations. And um, we have a very uh, strong focus on equity and on increasing the homeownership rates of BIPOC uh, communities. So um, th that's also really, you know, you've, you've got that income level um, and then you've got um, folks that have been historically excluded from homeownership for so long. How do you get, how do you get the word out to them? Um, and how do you really gain their trust? There's really two levels of that. Yeah, I was going to add on there, it's both Dawn and Stefka, thanks. Like, um, uh, we went, we had to go door to door, right? And it wasn't going to be me as a monolingual white dude knocking on these doors. I mean, even if I, I wanted to, I wanted to be a part of that. But number one, you're not going to get... Um, trust off that, and you're not going to be able to communicate. So you've got to have the partners that are members of those respective communities and trusted folks already that are willing to like go out and knock on doors. So, um, and that was difficult to, in the pandemic, that's you know, the only way we can get around was you know, just walking door to door. Another question in this same vein of engagement. Um, can you think of any strategies in your work that emerged as a direct result of engaging the community that maybe if you hadn't taken that community oriented approach, that strategy or that solution never would have come up? I can take that one first if you don't mind. I have two. So I'm going to start urban and then move rural. Um, the first is really, uh, we started out working um, toward really creating a barrier to displacement, right? So in Denver, we were working in communities where people were being pushed out and priced out. And so how can we get in and purchase homes, make them permanently affordable, make them available to people that are living there or used to live there so that they can return? Um, and as we started talking with folks, we found a few things. One. Um, there's two kinds of segregation, right? There's keeping people out and there's keeping people in. And what we were finding is as we were purchasing homes on the market, 
we of course are limited um, by how much we can spend, right? We only have so much subsidy. And um, so how do we do that? And, and as we're purchasing homes, we found we're purchasing homes in communities that are um, historically communities of color. We're in Westwood, we're in uh, Montbello, we're in Green Valley Ranch. Um, and so I hope, I, you know, as we were doing that, the, the idea was that this would be an opportunity for folks who've lived in that neighborhood for a long time to literally own a piece of that neighborhood that they helped to build. Um, so as we spoke with people, we learned a few things. One, in some neighborhoods, Westwood, for example, um, it could be that as we are developing new units that are affordable at 70, 80% AMI, um, the people that live there are not the ones that are going to be buying those. Um, we're going to be still serving, um, you know, families in need of affordable home ownership. Um, but the families that live there um, need affordability at 40 and 50% AMI. And so if our goal is to really keep people in place, it's really important that we subsidize to the point and engage the community to the point that they know that that is an available thing so that we're truly um, you know, against displacement and not contributing to it. Um, so that's one thing you know, that, that we had to kind of push our own model and subsidize even further. The other part of that um, is that we developed a program called Doors to Opportunity because we knew folks that wanted to have a home, um, but we're looking in neighborhoods other than those that we could afford to purchase, right? Homeownership is such a value-driven individual thing. Where you wanna live might be um, because you wanna be near a certain park. You might wanna be in a certain school district. Um, you may wanna live in the same neighborhood as your grandmother because she provides childcare, right? There's so many really, really unique and individual things to where you wanna own your home. Um, and so what this does is it creates a buyer-driven program where, and this program is specifically for families of color, um, so that they can access an additional subsidy on top of this so that they can go find the home that they want and Elevation will come alongside them and purchase it with them. Um, and so that was really created by engaging with folks in community. Um, the second part, uh, is that as we were looking in rural communities and wanting to move off the front range, um, we've been talking to people about what, you know, what are the needs in those communities. Um, and one, one of the things that we've been seeing is mobile home parks that are at risk. Um, and how do we really engage in that, right? So that was really a big conundrum for us because our uh, model is based on appreciation. It's shared appreciation, wealth building, um, and that's not what the mobile home park model does, right? That's an extractive uh, model. So, so how can we really be part of that um, and learn more about that? And um, we've developed a program that is really transforming mobile home parks into uh, permanent housing on foundations. Um, and we just yesterday heard that we are under contract to purchase the West Side Mobile Home Park in Durango. Um, we're super, really like, I can't tell you how excited we are about this, but it's totally due to talking with people in community. And in this case, it was the residents of Westside Mobile Home Park who led this and who brought this to Elevation to say, here's what we wanna do. Um, and they drove this. Um, we would not have gone out and purchased a mobile home park. Uh, it really didn't fit what we were doing um, until we spoke with people who were so, um, focused and, and committed to the place that they wanted to live. Congratulations on that. That's a hard one we've been trying to do in our community as well. But um, so I mentioned in my intro, uh, we're doing this huge housing study over 15 communities in six counties. Um, you know, we knew in the Valley that we were a whole um, and yet we're very siloed at the same time because each county has their own set of rules and regulations and each town and city does as well. Um, but through our study, we found that um, most everybody, every community was dealing with um, abandoned or dilapidated housing 
or um, households that had been living in the same home for generations, that these homes were no longer safe to live in because of generational poverty that didn't allow them to repair the homes as needed. And we now have two different groups that applied for funding um, through like roadmaps through recovery and different things that DOLA is doing so that they can strategize on how do they, they fix this need. Um, how do they come up with funding to help repair these homes even more than what my current programs can do? And how can they work together? Can they do urban renewal and then combine resources so only one director has to be hired to kind of manage all the counties together? And this is something I think without our housing study and the um, community involvement, we would have seen that um, come together because all of these different jurisdictions uh, worked with us on the housing study. And when they realized that their neighbor had the same need they had, then they were more willing to work together um, to make that happen. And so that was big, but I mentioned we had like eight projects going. Each of those projects came from the housing study. Um, they saw a need in the community and the community came together to figure out how could they strategize to find a solution. So we've seen redevelopment of vacant land um, and how can it be brought into um, housing development. We've seen um, the purchase of complexes that weren't traditionally affordable and bringing them into affordable ranges. We've seen developers that were traditionally high-end housing developers reaching for resources to bring in affordable for sale and for rent um, development. Um, and we're excited that we just announced last week that we are purchasing an elementary school to redevelop into housing. And this is something that we never would have thought of doing, um, but the housing study really kind of led us to some of these out of the box ideas because we were hearing the community say, there's this building or this lot of land or whatever's going on in their specific community that nobody's looking at and it would be a perfect place for a housing project. And the, the projects are, are now rolling. We're actually getting our own land trust in our community as well in some of the neighborhoods that have more expensive land and housing. And so lots of great things have come out of the many, I think we've held 14 or 16 different community engagement events um, over the last two years. And, and so taking that active listening that Jen said and, and visiting the sites and, and talking to the people and the elected officials both and figuring out how you can bring both of their visions together to make something happen. I don't know if I'm speaking for any other folks that have experienced this, but I, I think often um, in the nonprofit sector, we end up shooting ourselves in the foot because we don't play well together. Um, and maybe that's just generally speaking how human beings are. We get very territorial around things. Um, so one of the strategies that really came out of our uh, out of the process was, you know, you have, we had to be willing to put our money up, but step back. So um, not being, taking the glory, finding, asking, you know, who has a system already in place locally? Because we thought it would be important to have local people in power. So who has the system and will they play with us? You know, will they play nicely? And if not, you know, why not? Asking all those questions, what's keeping us from working together? Um, it always almost comes to um, how, who feels like they're not getting enough resources. So um, just working through those things, having lots of difficult discussions, and then being willing in the end to give over your control to those people that can um, take, take charge, who have the systems that you're going to need that, and you don't have time to develop. And that really did come out of working with Project Moxie on our strategy. And the other thing that was really, we never thought of doing was working a lot more closely with, um, with Cardinal. I mentioned is our largest employer and um, you know so our two partners Morton County Family Center social justice equity health equity Cargill profits efficiency you know um, one works with people with immediate need every single minute of every day 
the other cuts up cows and pigs and fish and all kinds of things and puts them in boxes. And we need people to do that, right? As long as we're going to eat meat, we got to have those folks. So I think for us, um, what emerged was we had to be willing to um, look for overlap, look where our interests overlapped. Cargill needs employees. They can't get employees because there's no place to live. We need houses and never losing sight of the fact that their employees are our community, the BIPOC community. Most of those employees are right there. And so we overlook that because we don't want corporate control. We don't want their voice involved, but they got the money guys. And so we take the money and we give them some control and then we keep what we can too. So everybody has got to work somehow to get around them. One question I want um, to be sure that we address before we move on to, we've got, we've got a great list of questions from our, our participants as well that I wanna make sure we leave time for, but before we move to those, ARPA funds, can you speak to how you are utilizing those and or how you're planning to utilize them, knowing that some of them are still kind of filtering down from our legislature to local levels, but what does that look like on the ground in your community right now, whether it's beginning to use the funds or planning for them? Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like in your, your own community? Um, the Doors to Opportunity program that I mentioned earlier, which is um, uh, an opportunity for folks, um, for BIPOC households to find their own homes and we would come alongside them and purchase them. Um, that is going to be funded through ARPA funding through the state, through their affordable housing um, fund that, that they've developed. Um, so that wouldn't be happening without that support. Um, it's going to be a huge um, game changer, I think. Um, and so, you know, that's going to be really important. Um, similarly, as Jen pointed out in her presentation, um, the funding availability for the development of affordable home ownership stock is really limited, right? Not just uh, through the state, but just generally. Um, it's, we don't have the same kind of tools like, um, like LIHTC funding um, that's available. And so, um, you know, both at the state level and uh, locally um, at other municipalities and counties that have um, their own ARPA dollars, like this is an opportunity to truly be transformational in what we're doing um, because these funding, you know, if I, I'm hoping that folks will be able to put it into the development of new units. That's really what's critical. Um, we need we need inventory, we need stock. Um, and so, you know, I'm hoping that 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 will be catalytic moving forward. So I don't know exactly what each community is doing with their funds. And when I saw this question, I did I did kind of look it up to see. Um, and I was really kind of shocked to see how few funds are coming to some of the communities. Um, majority of the communities in the Valley were getting like $100,000 or less. Um, and you, you can't build housing or do much with that. Um, there were a few that were getting a million up to 2 million, um, some of our bigger communities. Um, but if you're only getting 30,000 or 40,000, housing probably isn't gonna be a priority with ARPA funds. Um, but we what we are seeing, um, across the board of the six counties is uh, they're all looking at their policies. They're looking at are their policies bringing in the types of housing they want or is the types of housing they're getting because of their policies. Um, they're looking at infrastructure needs. They're looking at um, opportunities that I don't think without these funds they would have even thought about because they're such small communities. Um, and so these funds are giving them some abilities to make changes in their community, but I don't see it being directly like investment into housing for many of them. I don't really have much to add because I think that we're up for a little bit of a fight as a lot of maybe places are, there have been a lot of issues around transparency and who's making the decisions. Um, with what that money is going to be used for and who's not getting asked to participate in the conversations. So I think we still have a ways um, to go to know how our ARPA funds are going to be used. 
I just want to add working with strategy, a lot of where we're focusing right now is the state funds, right? Because we do have a lot of rural communities that aren't going to get enough money. And um, kudos to our partners in the state where we are creating some new strategies and it's really hard to innovate. <laughs> and so it, we're creating a lot of extra work for the state, but um, but we kind of have to because, you know, there, there's only so many things we can do. But uh, so I know for FM Cup and our partners, we're really looking at how the state can step in. And, and sometimes local governments are funding with other stuff, it, you know, so, but right, it's about awareness and knowing where it is. Yeah, and I know that ARPA will be, I think in some form discussed on every one of these remaining sessions, just because it is such a top of mind um, opportunity and just an enormous amount of money that's coming into our state and communities. And we'll continue to talk about that in various contexts as this series goes on, uh, because we wanna make sure that our local communities are as well equipped as possible to utilize that uh, kind of once in a generation funding opportunity. Um, as we go along here and move into audience Q&A, again, feel free to continue submitting questions. I'm gonna paste them in the chat as we go, um, just so we can all refer to them um, as we discuss them together. So this first one, this is, a, this is a tough and I think very thoughtful question. What does it look like slash how does one effectively balance the needs that concern addressing homelessness, which are frequently emergent, requiring rapid response, versus the needs of creating a community with enough affordable housing to keep the cost of living manageable. So emergency response, kind of more continuum of care crisis versus long-term development, this takes time. Any tips on, on balancing? I'm gonna try. Um, I, I think uh, we, when we do strategy work at the local level, sometimes we're asked to, to focus on workforce or you know, low income or families or unhoused, if we have the ability to influence that scope of work, we'll tell them you need to focus across the continuum, right? So Steph, I was in a meeting yesterday with our homeless council, and I said, we may uh, need to wait to start our engagement because we have to keep X number of households from being displaced from a mobile home park, right? So the, it, we're too connected. And so Again, I think you focus, this is a strategy, right? You focus on where you have capacity, you build it, you try to augment it. You may not be able to meet all the needs across the continuum, but that's the best we can do. And you acknowledge where those connections are. As Lauren said, the more we can connect across programs, the better our folks are served. So anybody else wanna try that one? Yeah, I was gonna say partnerships. Um, you know, we offer affordable housing and we often bring um, unhoused into housing and yet they need more resources than what we can provide. So building some great relationships and partnerships with those other organizations that can help provide the services. Um, because as you bring in the affordable housing and you bring down the cost of living, the unhoused will be able to become housed. Right now, they, they're in that situation because there's nothing for, for them to go to. Um, and so, cause the resources are scarce. So helping them with that immediate response and connecting them to the right resources, um, while you're still building and bringing in that new affordable housing and knowing that at some point in the future, the two, um, nexuses will cross each other and, and kind of help align each other, um, moving forward. I think it's so critical and Jen, you kind of touched on this, that that we balance investment across the spectrum. Um, and it, this is often so lost, I think, that, that each element of the housing continuum affects the other element, right? So um, we need to preserve what we have. That preservation is so critical because if we start to let things go to market, if we start to let things drop off um, and don't preserve them, then all of a sudden we see that need, which we're already so drowning in, um, just continue to rise, right? So we need to, to invest in preservation. We need to invest in, in new units because there aren't enough, right? Um, and when we don't invest, for example, in home ownership, that increases the need for rental because there's nowhere for those folks to go, um, right? We need to uh, invest in permanent supportive housing. Um, and if we don't do that, we are going to have more emergent things happening. And if we don't invest in rental, of course, we've got nowhere for the 
unhoused who are now housed to, to move into, right? It's all so, um, it's so connected. And um, that's why I think it's really critical to make sure that we balance that funding. And right now the existing tools create an unbalanced system, right? So you can use the LIHTC for this, but not for this or this, right? So, so that's, and that's the way that we're able to best leverage funding, right? Public funding, private funding, it's where you can make money developing affordable housing. Um, so where, where are we gonna in, make that investment so that we have that movement along the continuum? Matt, I wanna make sure I saw a question um, that I really liked here from Christy Milligan. Um, curious if any of our panelists has, have encountered a huge lack of political will um, and how they've worked to increase that will or worked around it. And that question is great because, uh, you know, the folks that should be your best allies sometimes are, are not, you know, the folks that control taxpayer dollars and what they can and can't spend, what they tell you they can and can't spend tax their money on. Um, one, of, one of the things that we did, and I hope that this would work for, for other folks, is um, we went to our city's comprehensive plan. And sometimes, unbeknownst to them, they put language in there that's great for you. Um, it's perfect because they all, they know this is going to be um, out there, you know, so they'll say that this um, comprehensive plan is going to, um, you know, set the stage for the next decade of growth and how they're going to put money into development and what they want to see. So you turn around and you have to continue to use their own language that they put in the plan in everything that you do when you come in front of them. And that's how we were able to get on board with us for some funding, which they rarely ever give. Um, they matched our funding for our housing needs assessment um, because we use the language that they put in their comp plan. And every time we sit down, we go back to the comp plan and say, well, the stakeholders in your comp plan, you know, and, and, we, and we just use that to help them stay on the team with us as, as, as possible. I'm going to say education on this one. Um, many, many of our elected officials, as we got started, um, had the same perceptions of affordable housing that many of the community members had. And they, we often heard, well, all the money goes into affordable housing for the lowest income households. What about the rest of us? And educating them that affordable is across every income level. And we can meet the needs of many by working on projects together um, and has been huge. And we went from having a struggle to even get our rehab programs into some of these communities or our down payment assistance because just the lack of understanding to now having every county and every jurisdiction um, working with us on the housing needs because they understand that saying affordable housing doesn't mean the social, you know, the 30% area median income. So 10 to 12, $14,000 a year, but we're looking all the way up to um, the educators, the nurses, the, and everybody in between, and how can we help them? My program may not help them. My program may be limited, but I'm gonna help them find the programs out there that are gonna help those that they're hearing from. And I'm gonna be at their meetings. I'm gonna participate in their events. Um, I worked closely with the city of Alamosa on their housing study. So when the nimbyism that not in my backyard was showing up um, that often leads the political will, um, we were able to educate the people in those meetings on what we were trying to do and why we were trying to do it. So being that key partner um, with those that uh, have control over the political will and make sure that they know I've got your back if you've got mine in a way, you know, like I'm going to show up and help you um, explain and educate the community um, if you're going to give us the opportunity to do so. And it, it those partnerships and relationships have been um, huge in what we're doing. We have a question here. Um, specifically pertaining to the Denver area. Um, 
this individual says, I'm not yet understanding how these strategies can translate to areas such as central and north Denver, where demand for affordable housing is huge, but the market is strong. The cost of land is prohibitive, putting it politely. Creating a viable capital stack to fund affordable housing is difficult, and the upcoming EA at EAH policy will not address deep affordability. So how can we support the delivery of homes for those in that zero to 70% AMI range in Denver, particularly when Chaffa tax credits are so competitive throughout the state? I just started typing the answer to that. So this is the, the most frustrating thing is that we have these federal tools that work, but we don't have enough. We never have enough. So the way that we address um, renters earning less than 70% of area median income with a tax credit program is you've got to use a lot of subsidy or you have to have a voucher. Um, we just, the tax credit program was not set up to create that deep of a subsidy, right? So as Stefka talked across the continuum, if we had a continuum right now, the tax credit program, I mean, it serves zero to 60% AMI. So you can go up to 60%, um, but I, I should be really clear. It's, it's the 40%, 30% and below that are really difficult to serve with just a tax credit. So we combine, we combine lots of resources. Um, again, what was fascinating about COVID is um, we finally had the conversations our industry has been waiting for for 20 years. We are 30 years behind in federal policy period dot. And I don't know if we can catch up, but if we can't start to have the conversation about catching up now, we probably won't. Um, because we're, we're finally at the point where there's no way to provide these below market programs without big increases somewhere. And so, um, so we know we know uh, not all the federal program programs work, but a few of them work really well and they just need to be expanded. In Denver, one other thing, Denver land is very expensive. Um, look at churches, anchor, anchor institutions, creative ways, community colleges, um, folks that have land and, and um, or work with groups that are acquiring land. Um, it's all about partnership and stuff, but you could probably speak to this now better than I. Yeah, I will add too that I think um, there was a day where if someone would donate land, that's all we needed, right? That was enough and that day is gone. Um, we need to combine every single thing that's out there. Um, you know, you can donate land and get local and state subsidy and still not be able to get there. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, our, our capital stacks are crazy looking. Um, Honestly, and, and, and I'm sure, you know, rental projects and LIHTC projects are, are far more complex, right? Because those are um, completely different animals. But, um, you know, we have to put a lot of philanthropic dollars in there as well. All of these, all these sources are, are limited. Um, and I think for us, um, it is about um, making something permanently affordable, keeping that subsidy retention so that we are not just serving one household, and we're not just serving one community for 15 years or 20 years. Um, this is something that is, once you put all of those different pieces in, right, it's so complex, you've got public dollars, private dollars, like now what we need is a piece of public infrastructure. And that's what affordable housing is at all ends of the spectrum. It needs to be a key support of a community. And um, as such, that investment needs to be retained permanently. I have another question that gets at kind of the, the classic um, problem in community engagement, which is NIMBYism, right? Any progress around the classic comment, I support affordable housing, but perhaps not here where I have to look at it, um, traffic, et cetera. So how do we educate folks on the benefits and how these things, any, any practical tips or perhaps success stories to share on addressing that specific dynamic of development? So challenging. And I want to hear what Steph has to say. I mean, what I think it's really challenging and nobody funds that work. I just want to say that, right? Like of all the stuff we talk about and all we do, nobody funds the education broadly or consistently ever. Um, and so uh, for that reason, we don't always do the engagement or the, the things we need to do, right, that would make it a lot easier and be better. Um, uh, being transparent, I think, and saying this is what we're building, being clear what's on the table for discussion and what is not, it's really important. There's a lot of things that, I'm, you know, you don't have to like. I, I don't like your house, right? So I think we've created this, like, public 
engagement process where people think it's all on the table for discussion and it's not. And so I think it's an art and a science to, to queue up, we're gonna do this project. Uh, it's gonna look like this. Here's what you can talk about. You can tell us where you'd like the fence. You can tell us about this or that. But um, I think we've just not historically done a great job in this industry of doing that. I think we've gotten a lot better. Um, so, so I think queuing up the conversation, the other trick we've learned is that, um, and I love this so much, and this is Denver, a lot of folks doing this in Denver, and I think Ismail kind of piloted this, and I love it. You do open houses on projects, and you have small tables, so that you don't have that mob mentality, honestly, and people have to come, and they have to get to know somebody on your staff, and they have to engage, and they have to focus on something that's tangible about the project they don't like, they don't get to say, I don't like it, and so, right? So I, I really love that process a lot. I hope that's helpful around a specific project. I was just gonna say, and I think you said it as well, um, and it might not be popular, but um, you know, there has to be a point, and this is where political will comes into play. We need city staff, we need local electives to say like that one voice, like it does, it's not gonna stop what the community needs. And we need to be able to stick to our guns and our policies. Um, you know, if we have an overlay that says no parking is required, um, we can't have another funding entity. Um, you know, if we've got that as a local policy and then we have the state coming in and then we have, you know, someone else, someone else say, well, I'm not gonna fund this because there's no parking. It's like, well, the city decided they don't want parking here if it's affordable. And that's one of the ways we're going to get to affordability. Like, let's all, we need to be aligned and we need to stick to our guns. And we can't have someone in the community coming up and saying, there's no parking here when we've already decided that that is a policy that we're, that, you know, everyone's behind that's passed. We can't change that. Like, that's, that's that point, like you said, Jen, where, you know, you don't get to change that. Like, you, you, you get to have your opinion here, but this is not um, an area where you get to influence this. And then I think I, I try to make it a little more personal to the person who is providing the NIMBYism. So if somebody comes to my meeting and says, um, for instance, I think it says, I don't want those people or I don't want low income, um, I break down the numbers. Um, I did this just the other day and it was quite shocking for someone to say, um, do you realize that um, you're grocery worker or your teacher is making X $30,000 a year, which means they can only afford $600 a month in rent. Um, and that's who, we're, that's who we're focusing on is your child's teacher. Um, could you imagine if you only could afford $600 a month in rent, but the cheapest thing you could find on the market was $1,400, like how would you navigate that? And, and we're not trying to, um, over overpower your home or your neighborhood or your wishes. We're just trying to make sure that the people in your community that you um, that you see and talk to every single day have the same opportunities as you. And again, a lot of time that education is that they don't understand. They they don't realize that their employees, if they're a business, probably qualifies for affordable housing because they can only afford to pay so much, therefore their employees can only afford to pay so much or their neighbor, their sister, their child can only afford it. So making sure you find a little bit of something that makes them step back and think about this really isn't such a bad thing that it's not for just the what's in my mind, it's for everybody across the board, um, really kind of helps people open up um, their minds and and really start listening to what we're talking about when it comes to housing. So we've got four minutes left on this Friday afternoon, but um, I think our last question here, and again, we'll be um, sending out questions that we weren't able to get to on our, uh, live here, we will be sending out in our recap email. So. Um, we've got your full list of questions. We thank you all for being so engaged and for submitting questions. Um, this one, this individual said, maybe you'll get to this, but the problem we're running into is water rights, right? So any strategies for funding water, and I know this is an issue across our state. Um, so when it comes to specifically water rights and running up against those barriers in development, any strategies for that? 
I, I've taken it from an opposite perspective, but it's the same thing, right? We have a limited amount of resource. So what I'm running up against is um, unbridled development and we're gonna run out of water, right? Same issue, you got limited land, you got limited water. Um, getting more and more comfortable with, we need to use policy and regulation to get product type. We just have to, the market is not gonna give us huge diverse product type. And so, um, you know, I, I think, you know, when we talk to communities, we say, Lauren knows this, we say, make sure that the pipeline you're, it, that's work, it's in production, because you're not going to get 600 units again. How do you tap into those units? Because it's kind of one and done. So, um, so if you don't have water to develop, it's much like land, you're probably going to have to be really creative and spend a lot of money. I wonder if, and I know you've got to pay for taps and things like that, but I wonder if there's more of a infill, more of a preservation strategy in the short term, if water is an issue, there's always something you can do in housing besides just build, I guess is what I would say. And I, I know that's not a great answer, but water shortage is real. Anyone else want to add, please? I'm making this up. So we haven't seen a lot of issues with water, but more with um, infrastructure capacity, like sewer capacity. Many of our small rural communities are being told that their outdated sewer systems have to have a $30 million rehab um, or that they're limited. Uh, we've had one community tell us that they probably can handle 10 to 15 new homes um, on their sewer system before they have to redo it and yet their need is over a hundred homes. And so there's bits and pieces that have to be figured out um, as well. And I think, I think the big thing that's coming out of and, and you know, COVID has brought in lots of money and lots of resources and opened a lot of eyes um, of our government and other funding individuals is, um, you know, look at, Look at outside the box, whether it's for your sewer system or water rights or whatever that might be. Um, look outside the box. Um, in our community, we're having a big water battle and we've been having it for decades because our water is sold um, to the Denver area and to Texas and to all over the place. And we're really trying to fight that because now we're not gonna have enough water for our own community because our water is dispersed all over the place. Um, but we're finding ways to, to be outside the box and build new partnerships and new funding resources to kind of help with some of these issues um, that's just not the norm. So you, you've got to be willing to um, put some time and effort into something that two years ago you wouldn't even thought to look at. I want to be respectful of everybody's Friday afternoon and your time and um, one more just big round of thanks for our panel for joining us this afternoon, offering your time and expertise. And I will point to our, our next session on May 6th, uh, specifically focuses on housing policy and land use. Um, we've already got some exciting speakers teed up for that and really looking forward to that, that discussion and that presentation. Um, and with that, I think we will let you all get to your weekend. So thank you again, and we will see you on May 6th. Look for those invitations coming shortly.